in this video I am discussing the concept related to these four fundamental questions. What is Hilbert space? A vector space satisfying an additional condition. What is the norm of a vector in a Hilbert space? What is meant by orthogonal vectors in Hilbert space? And what is meant by the completeness relation for a Hilbert space? So let us proceed and discuss these additional aspects of complex vector spaces. From this point onward, I will mostly use the terminology of physicists and would like to use the phrase Helmer space instead of using the general phrase that is vector space. With this picture in mind, I would like to begin from the first question that is, what is a Helmer space? In the language of physicists, the answer is really straightforward and simple, and it goes like this. Helmer space is the playground of quantum mechanics. Or in other words, Helmer space is the arena where atomic and subatomic particles live. On the other hand, in mathematical language, the definition of Helmer space is still not complete, even though we know almost about all the properties of vector spaces from my previous videos of this playlist. In order to completely understand the concept of Helmer space, we must clarify a few more concepts. The concept related to some physical quantity of practical importance. But before coming to that, let me put the mathematical definition on the table. Mathematically, a Helmer space is an inner product vector space over the set of complex numbers which is complete under the operation of norm defined through inner product. Since I have already discussed the properties of inner product in the video part 3 of this playlist, let us use them to understand the concept of norm, a conditional requirement for Helmer space. So let H be a Helmer space and get H be a vector residing in the Helmer space with the inner product of the draw of alpha and the kit of alpha is written as draw times alpha and the square root of this inner product is called the norm of alpha. And it is written by putting the vector into parallel lines. It is written as the norm of alpha equals the square root of the inner product of alpha with itself, which can be expressed as the square root of the sum of the modular squares of Ai. Where, AI, where an AI is called the component of alpha. The norm of a vector in Hilbert space is always a non-negative real positive number and satisfies the following properties. The norm of alpha is always either greater or equal to zero. It is equal to zero only if alpha is a null vector. If A is a complex number, then a alpha is another element of the same Hilbert space in the norm of A in the norm of vector A alpha equals the modulus of A times the norm of vector alpha. If kit alpha 1 and kit alpha 2 are two vectors in the Hilbert space, then the norm of the sum of these two vectors is always lesser or equal to the is always lesser or equal to the sum of the norm of individual vectors, that is the norm of alpha 1 plus alpha 2. This is in fact the triangle inequality. The, the proof of the first one is obvious from the definition is because the norm of vector alpha equals the square root of the sum of the modulus square of the component of alpha. AI, where absolute AI square is always a positive number and therefore the sum of all positive numbers is also a positive number and the square root of a positive number always gives rise to a positive number. That means the norm of alpha is always a positive number. The second property is also very easy to prove because the norm of a times alpha is in fact the square root of the inner product of vector a times alpha 
and proceeding that in this way the draw of A is in fact the complex conjugate of A and therefore we can multiply S in A to make it A modulus square and the modulus square can be taken out from the square root and therefore it becomes absolute times the norms of alpha. The third one can be proven through triangle inequality which is a little involved and I'm leaving it unproven over here. Now the question is what in fact the norm of a vector physically represents. Since we know from our previous videos that the inner product is in fact a generalization of the dot product of vectors in three-dimensional vector space. And the dot product in three-dimensional vector space with itself give rise to length of the vector. Therefore, the norm of a vector in Hilbert space is a generalization of the magnitude or length of a vector in three-dimensional vector space. So the norm corresponds to length or magnitude of a vector in Hilbert space. The generalization of norm can be used to find the distance between two vectors of a Hilbert space. For that, let alpha 1 and alpha 2 be two vectors of the Hilbert space, then, then the norm of the difference of two vectors can be written as the square root of the sum of the modulus square of the distance of the corresponding component of the two vectors. Now, if the distance between any two vectors, alpha m and alpha m, obeys the property such that limit m y n tends to infinity, then the norm alpha 1 minus alpha 2 goes to 0. This property is called Cauchy sequence. If the Cauchy sequence is satisfied, then the helper space is said to be complete over the norm. This equation means that when the number of elements reaches infinity, the norm goes to zero. Now, an inner product vector space over the set of complex number which is complete over the norm is called Halbert space. Now, let's move to the third question, the orthogonal vectors within Halbert space. The angle between two vectors alpha 1 and alpha 2 of the Hilbert space is obtained by generalizing the dot product of three-dimensional vector space. That is, if A and B are two vectors within the three-dimensional Hilbert space, then the dot product of these vectors is written as A dot B equals modulus of A times modulus of B times the cos of the angle between them. From this equation, I can straight away write that the cos of the angle is in fact equal a dot b divided by the product of the modulus of the two vectors. This equation is generalized in the uh, helper space and the angle between two vectors is expressed as cos of the theta equals the inner product of the two vectors that is alpha 1 alpha 2 divided by the product of the norms of the two vectors. Now it can easily be seen from this equation therefore theta equals pi by 2 the inner product goes to 0. Under this condition, the two kits are said to be orthogonal. Additionally, if the two kits satisfy the condition such that the inner product with itself is equal to 1, that is, the inner product of alpha 1 equals the inner product of alpha 2 equals 1, these vectors are then said to be normalized. These two conditions put together are usually written in the form of a chronicle delta that is if alpha i and alpha j are two vectors of the helper space then the orthogonality and the normalization condition is jointly expressed by writing the inner product of draw alpha i times kit alpha j equals delta i j where the delta i sub i j is chronicle delta and describe the orthonormality condition. This set of factors satisfying the orthonormality condition is called orthonormal set or the set of orthonormal vectors. This set constitutes the basis of the hyperspace and in order to distinguish them 
from the resurrection of the skin of the space instead of representing them by kit and for i they are usually represented by writing kit e sub i now in terms of the basis any kit of the helper space can be expressed as a linear superposition of the basis vectors that is alpha equals sum over the dimensions i of the helper space over a sub i times kit e sub i and in this form the numbers a i are then called the probability amplitudes whose modulus square gives probability of the kit alpha in the direction of a given basis EI. The value of the probability amplitude of a particular subscript, for example, AJ, can be obtained by projecting the K to that particular basis vector. For example, if I want to find out the probability amplitude A sub J, then I have to project the vector along the direction of EJ. And that is done mathematically by taking the inner product of ej by taking the inner product of broad ej with the vector since ai is a number therefore i can change therefore i can change its position with respect to draw ej and written in this form now draw ej times kit ei is in fact the chronicle delta function and employing the properties of chronicle delta function it carries the sum and picks only the values of aj. So aj can be written as the inner product of broad ej with kit alpha. Now, if it is true for a given aj, obviously every probability amplitude can be expressed this way. And therefore, I can write ai equals the broad ei times the kit alpha. If I substitute this value back into the defining equation of alpha, I can arrange the equation into this form. Alpha equals sum over i draw ei times alpha times ei. Since the inner product of ei with alpha is a number, therefore I can change its position with respect to get ei and can rewrite it as the kit EI times broad EI times alpha. Now, reparameterizing the equation into this form and comparing the left and right side of the equation we have at the right side alpha and we have at the left side of the equation alpha and similarly at the right side of the equation alpha so this equation is valid only if the entity inside the brackets is 1. So setting that to 1, I get sum over i kit ei times broad ei equals identity matrix i. If the set of basis vectors satisfy this condition, they are then called complete. That is, the set of basis vector is complete in the sense that every other vector of the helper space can accurately and completely be expressed in terms of the linear combinations of them. And this representation of kit and bra in the form alpha in the form kit alpha i times bra alpha j is, is called outer product which is an operator and constitute a square matrix whose order is equal to the dimension of the Hilbert space. And for the unit vector such an outer product is called a projector because when it is applied to any kit of the Hilbert space it always project the kit into that particular basis. For example, if I apply the outer product of E1 to the kit alpha, then I can rewrite the equation into this form. That is, I can change the position of AI with respect to outer product of E1 and E1. And at the end, I have E1 times EI, which constitutes a delta function. And that is of course equal to zero for all i except for i equal to one which is then one and i can express alpha as a1 times e1 so the outer product 
of Bess's vector in fact works as a projector and it always projector any superposition state into a single basis vector.